Welcome to the Penguin Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Tate. Joining me as always, Nick Lacapo. Nick, how you doing? Me and Archie today. <laughs> oh, what's going on, Archie? Sorry, Archie was passed out, and then I just forcefully picked him up off my lap and showed him to the camera. Not much. Uh, waiting for the uh, the uh, the storm riding this podcast house podcast out before whatever we're about to get hit by out there out this window. I can tell it's going to be wild. Oh, is it going to be? Oh man, it's. I just came from Nashville, and it was seventy degrees and gorgeous every day there. Oh, it's 70 degrees now. Uh, I just ran down by the river and it is basically in my backyard at this point. Uh, it's overflowing. So yeah, uh, this might be our last podcast. Eric. <laughs> yeah. If, if a podcast doesn't go up next week, it's because we were lost in the storm. <laughs> yeah, there might, there honestly might be a tornado siren that happens during this podcast. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's talk real quick about a new trick that came out, which was Entourage by Gordon Bean. And uh, mm. you had a lot to do with this one. Yeah, just dropped uh, on Monday. And I mean, this is an older trick. Yeah. Uh, Gordon is just, is he the, pa he's like him and Bannon got to be like up there with like I the packet so. trick kings, right? Yeah, it's, it's, but, like, uh, it's, yeah. it's Max, Bannon, and mm. Bean are like, those are the three packet trick go-tos that I've had for years now. And no this doubt. Is, this is a fun well, one because this is like, yeah. It's almost it's, like it's, the wave, but like it's yeah, it's in the same world. Uh, it's an older, it, you know, it's an older release, mm -hmm. so it's got you know the thing about all of Gordon's tricks. And I don't want to talk too long mm -hmm. about uh, the trick, but these are pack of tricks that have existed for you know going on twenty years now, <laughs> you know, yeah, and which means they're just thought out, right? Everything is figured out with them. They they hit hard. They reset instantly. They're just an easy trick to pick up, throw it into your set, and you got something new. And yeah, you're right. It's it's similar to Boive in that um, the name they, the your spectator essentially names a queen, and that queen that they name is shown to be the only queen that exists among the packet of cards that you have. Um, but there's a lot of really cool choices that the spectator gets along the way. Mm -hmm. It'll fool you. You know, I was actually disappointed in in the video, Eric. Really? Because like I found it very challenging to convey just how strong of a trick it is yeah. through, through the camera. And mostly because there's multiple choices that are very important that are made by the spectator. And I know anytime we watch things on the internet that like has a free choice, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel that free unless you see it in person. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember like at the end of it, I'm like, man, th this, I, the video is good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I was just like, man, this trick is better than I, like, I just felt like it was better than what, uh, what the video I made was. So, but I think that just goes to, you know, you can't really do it without a spectator and, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great trick. It's a, great it's trick. Awesome. It'll, fool, it'll fool you. It'll fool you bad. I think that part of what is so fooling about it is that like with Wave, you know, that you're, there's really only one option right you're, yeah. you're guiding them towards one option but with entourage it's it's literally any suit uh and there's a cool um i actually liked the the bonus trick that came with it the psychic black That's trick right. which yeah is, there's actually like more gimmicks that you get that don't have to do with entourage at all you get to do a different trick called psychic blackjack which yeah. is similar like it works similarly but the the the, uh, the cards are just different and yeah, just to go back on your point, like the difference, the main difference between the two, when we're talking about like equivoque, um, where you have to get to a certain area with Boive, mm -hmm. with with Entourage, none of that is necessary. However, you get you still get to use equivoque, but not because you need to force any situation. Mm -hmm. It's just that like the nice thing about equivoque is it makes the choices important or feel important, whether you're guiding them in a direction or not. But with entourage, it doesn't matter what they say. So, so you yeah. get the best of both worlds, which is yeah. really cool. It's a great trick. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the reactions to it now that it's back. Um, oh, yeah. You need to take it to Town Hall. Yeah. Oh, I'm going if to. If you don't know, that's Eric's uh, <laughs> restaurant gig on the weekends, Town Hall. <laughs> yeah. I uh, So I had uh, actually, 
the guest this week filled in for me at Town Hall, uh, Chris Hanwell, that we're going to talk mm. to a little bit later. He's one of the fill-ins when I go on the road because I was uh, I was playing House of Cards in That's Nashville, right. and out of nowhere, Nathan Fan showed up. Wild. He just like walked Wild. in on I think it was Thursday night. And, uh, and like saw my show and Nathan hasn't seen my show. So he just like, wasn't oh, funny. ready for what was happening. Uh, has he, had he been to house of cards before? Yeah. He's performed there. Okay. Uh, as a matter I of figured fact, he had to have been, but so, you know, he does the, uh, he does a mental epic in his show. Yeah. In, in the balloon. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not just in the balloon, but he's got like a special gimmick calculator as well. And he sells it in his lecture. And I know that he's performed there because every time I get into a new performer's condo, I always like go through all of the cabinets and see if there's like foil or, you know, what do I have to go to the grocery store to buy? And there was a couple of Nathan fans, mental epics in one of the <laughs> upper cupboards, like his luggage was too heavy. And so he just had to abandon Sleeping. merch behind yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I've done shows with Nathan and he brings more stuff than everybody else owns yeah. to a show. I mean, God, he's got commitment to to the show for sure. Uh, I travel. He travels with birds. That's all you need to know. Yes, yeah, that really is. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that happened before we get into uh, a, a listener request this week was uh, Joey, the uh, entertainment director, asked if I would do the family brunch shows on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've said, yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm not, I wouldn't describe myself as a family entertainer, but I'm not like lewd or dirty. Uh, but then I did sort of realize that maybe on Easter morning with children in the crowd, maybe I shouldn't do Nick the Duck you know, with his mm. prison tattoos and cigarettes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I immediately... In Tennessee. In Tennessee, yeah. Yeah. So I immediately got on <laughs> Penguin when Joey asked me, and I had overnighted x Light. Oh, man. <laughs> I have had so much fun. I can't wait to start doing it at Town Hall. It's so good. It looks You're going to walk around with it? I'm going to walk around with it. Oh man, you gotta you gotta get that smoke watch in there too at the same time. Oh, hundred percent! It looks so good with the smoke device. Yeah, that thing looks crazy. It totally is totally crazy. It's insane. So you gonna work on your Harry Potter themed act, or are you gonna? Uh, no, I have a I I found a uh, a legally playable sound alike Harry Potter theme song uh, mm. to play while I while I magic the the feather out of the air, but. I totally would have, when, when I worked at Universal Studios, um, we, I, one of the theaters I worked at was right outside of Hogwarts, which was crazy when you think about it. It's yeah. like, I'm literally doing a magic show. And when you go up inside <laughs> the door, there's Hogwarts Castle, like right next to you. And likewise, all the kids that used to come to the show would be wearing robes and they would bring wands and all that. But I had a couple Harry Potter themed routines that I made. One was, um, I had the vanishing bottle. Mm-hmm. But I, I changed the labels to uh, Butterbeer, and uh, I made a six-pack of it. And so I would do the Vanishing Butterbeer, which was good. I also had a Harry Potter book test, which was fun as well. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So It was, it was just uh, using, like, uh, uh, touching on Hoy type stuff. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, not, nothing nothing gimmicked or anything like that. But, yeah, yeah, it was fun. That actually gets us to uh, the listener request this week. Uh, we had a listener reach out, and they said, you know, you've interviewed a whole bunch of magicians, but the person who they don't know anything about is you. So I thought oh. we would find out about sort of your magic journey, where you came from, how you got there, how you ended up at Penguin, and, uh, and what you're doing these days. Because... Yeah. Yeah. Like, so yeah. where did you get started in magic? Cause you came to it later in life. Like I did. Right. Yeah. I didn't. I like, I grew up on a chicken farm in Massachusetts. There was no magic. Right. <laughs> and the only magic I knew was Copperfield on TV, but I had no way to relate to that. I didn't know, you know, if you, if you ever saw those shows, they happen in like a theater and it's big stage illusions and things. I used to love watching it, but I didn't know, thinking back, I didn't know what I was watching. I didn't know it was like, I didn't even know what a theater was. Mm -hmm. So I, at no point did I think it was something you could do. I just thought he had like special powers. <laughs> so it wasn't, it, and like, I always liked magic. I, I did all the layman tricks, mm -hmm. you know, the Biddle trick, 21 card trick. Yeah, I just really loved them and did them a lot and you know, I would love to see a footage of myself doing them now, but I just know that like I was the one person that remembered how to do them. Yeah. None of my friends would remember how to do them, but I always did. Mm -hmm. So that always led to people buying me 
you know, card trick books for Christmas, which I never read. And mm-hmm. it wasn't until Blaine came on TV and I was about 18, 17, 18. And he was doing magic on the street. He was doing magic in the bars. He was doing magic for regular looking people. And I was so confused because I, I mean, I was, certain he was from another planet there's no possible way anything he was doing was explainable Mm -hmm. but it dawned on like that was the first time i felt like i saw a magic trick like like a close-up trick and didn't realize that like is that something that i can do and then it it was me just watching that special a a bunch of times that um you know now blaine doesn't do this because he doesn't have to he just has real power but i realized what what you might be able to do with a double lift mm-hmm. right um like i said david didn't use one of those but no he's just he's i think we've established many times on this podcast that he yeah has, he has real magic powers he just he just really does these things and all yeah. we're doing is a pale imitation yeah i realized if i picked up two cards at the same time which was in scarney on cards i'd remember there was one trick on scarney on cards that mm-hmm. i real i i did a lot and it had it look scarney on cards has no sleight of hand in it but for some reason there's one trick that has a double lift even though it doesn't call it a double lift it just says you have to turn two cards over as one Mm -hmm. i just had like kind of remember that and realize wow if i did that i can do this trick and this trick and this trick and that kind of started me off i did Mm -hmm. you know the two card money routine yeah from that special and uh ambitious card of course i didn't know the names of any of these tricks back then uh, the torn or restored card, um, card and beer bottle, all these things. Once I realized, like you yeah. could have more than one of a card in a deck. Oh man, that un- <laughs> I'm sure that unlocked was, a lot of stuff. For yeah, me. monster secrets unlocked. This is also before the internet. You yeah. know, it's just before the internet. Like the internet exists, but there's no no magic information on the internet. You know, no, this is well before Penguin exists. Uh, yeah, know, I think like yeah. Illusionist is like in its infancy. Just back then. just becoming a thing. Yeah. Like it's just about around the corner, it's, which is what hooked me. Right. It's hard to remember back to a time before Blaine, you know, because I was maybe 15, 16 because we're, we're a couple years apart. We're pretty close in age, but a couple years apart. But it's it's really hard to go back and remember what it was like before Blaine was out there and had this, Mm -hmm. you know, seeing people do magic for regular looking people was, I mean, it was, it was revolutionary at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never, I mean, and we take it for granted. Yeah. We, we, we know that when we show somebody a a magic trick, they've likely never seen a magician before and they'll never see another magician again. Yeah. Uh, And I was that person. I'd never seen close up magic until Blaine on TV Mm -hmm. and, so I went from so knowing just those three to four to five tricks, yeah. whatever it was, I did magic on my own mm-hmm. uh, as I turned, you know, into my early 20s going out to bars and things. That was just the the tool that I used to to hang out, to yeah. meet people. I, I would go to concerts all the time and and like kind of challenge myself like tonight I'm going to meet the band or tonight I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. And that's, I just did reps. Um, I didn't know a single other magician. I was just, that was my social tool Mm -hmm. to uh, find adventure and go have fun. No. And uh, yeah. When did you start meeting other magicians then? Well, after I got into it a bit, uh, I'm probably like in my early Mm twenties and my mom found a a, a magic convention, a Hank Lee's uh, Cape Cod Conclave. I don't remember which year I attended. It was probably like 04 or 03 or something mm-hmm. like that. And I was like, uh, I was a little unsure because when she, when she found the convention, she signed me up for it. And I also, at the time I was working in Boston at um, Lycos.com search engine. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't realize that uh, you, you have a, a pretty storied history in programming in the internet. I do. Um, very fun. That's a whole nother, yeah. that's a whole nother video. But, um, so I, I snuck down, took the subway to, uh, South Boston to go to Hank Lee's magic shop. Mm-hmm. And I went in there and they sold me, uh, Michael Lamar easy to master and, uh, Bill Malone on the loose and Doc Eason. I spent, I mean, that's a lot of money back then. I bought the, yeah. I bought like Michael Lamar one, two, and three easy to master Doc Easton, one, two, and three, and Bill Malone, one, two, and three. 
And I, I just yeah, remember like I was dropping a lot of money yeah. and I was like, these guys better not be full of it. Right. <laughs> and I also remember, and this kind of goes into it, like yeah. th- th- I just got treated like an idiot there. Yeah. I just remember, and it's a Boston attitude thing too. Like I, I remember going to that shop and being like, who are these guys? <laughs> like, I know my history. I've been out there for like five years doing yeah. magic. I was probably terrible. Right. Yeah. But I had a, you know, who, who are these magicians? Like they, they think they're good. Right. And I just remember whether I maybe I came across the wrong way, but I remember I didn't leave there going like, oh, yeah, I want to go hang out with those guys. I thought magicians were stupid. <laughs> and I went to the convention and my my assumptions were confirmed. Um, <laughs> I uh, I went to the convention. Now, the first lecture, the first lecture I ever saw was at Hank Lee's and it was Garrett Thomas. And Wow. Uh, the first trick was the ring thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy crap. Yeah. Am I about to just like learn? And, Cause I, my only, my only thing guide to learning at that time was the stuff on Blaine, but then the DVDs I just bought. So I was like, man, the lectures are incredible. I look at what I just learned. Yeah. And then the next lecture was something on silks and the next lecture was something on kids birthday magic. And I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I was like, and I didn't meet anybody that I thought was cool. Yeah. And I just kind of wrote magicians off. Yeah. And again, went down my own path, just doing magic by myself. Uh, but now having like some mentors and those mentors were Michael Lamar and Doc Eason and Bill Malone. Um, and then that's kind of when the internet popped up. Right. Yeah. And that's when I started learning more stuff online. And that's when you start realizing not everybody's as good as <laughs> Michael Lamar <laughs> and Doc Eason and Bill Film alone. Yeah. Uh, I guess fast forward a little bit. Like, I, because I had my own thing going on. I was running my own company doing, um, I I ran an online video game. Mm -hmm. So magic was purely fun on the weekends going out and just getting free drinks and meeting people, getting into adventures. But then I I wanted to get out of the the business that I was in. Mm -hmm. I moved to Florida and moved in with a high school buddy. And, so th- this is just kind of, this is, this is weird stuff. Yeah. I, at this point, I, I've kind of fast forwarded like 10 years. Cause now it's like 2009. Cause it, at some point, didn't you and Shin Lim and Michael Feldman all hang out in Boston? Yeah. That's just after this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like 2009. Yeah. And I'd been messing with magic. Just only, literally, I've probably been doing the same tricks for, um, you know, going on 10 years now. Yeah. Uh, and I realized I had never bothered to see if like Michael Lamar was a real person. Uh, <laughs> I just thought he was like a guy that lived in my DVD player. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was like religious, like, and I know that this might even sound crazy too. On Fridays I would shave my head. Mm-hmm. Cause that's what I, that's what I did. I kept my hair nice and tight to the top of my head. Mm-hmm. And then I would also watch Easy to Master or Malone or Doc Eason for like the 10,000th time to look for any new trick or line or move or something that I'd missed so that I could go out that night and and mess with it. That's how well I know that material on those DVDs. Yeah. And then it just dawned on me like, whoa, what, is this Michael guy like a real guy? Mm-hmm. And now the internet was robust enough where I could look him up. And it just so happened he was... I was in Sarasota, Florida at the time. Mm-hmm. He was coming to Sarasota to do a lecture like the next week. Wow. I was like, holy crap, I got to I gotta go to that. You yeah. know, I, I knew what a lecture was, but I really hadn't been to one since, you know, the Garrett Thomas and mm-hmm. then the Silks and the, you know, whatever else. Um, so I, I went, I had to join IBM to go, mm-hmm. um, join the local IBM ring and uh, met Michael. And that, I mean, that was cool, but... <laughs> The guy that was running Michael's tech was Jeff Kaler. Oh, and okay. Jeff, we're about the same age. I think he's a few years younger than me, but I was like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. And how is he running tech for Michael Lamar? And I should probably know who this person is. Mm-hmm. So, and of course we were the youngest guys there too. It was an IBM meeting in Florida. So <laughs> you can imagine. Um So we hit it off right away. Obviously Jeff is also from Massachusetts. So we got along and he said, Hey, come hang out in Orlando. So I, um, I went, I moved, I went to a hangout in Orlando, like the next day 
And no lie, I moved into the Magic Estate two weeks later. <laughs> it's just there's a big yeah. the Magic Estate was this giant house still exists uh, in in Florida. It was a big mansion where like seven magicians lived in it mm-hmm. all at the same time. And uh, yeah, I moved in and uh, lived there for four to five years. I ended up meeting Mike Eaton, who put me in touch with uh, Attilio, mm-hmm. the owner of Theater Magic, who got me a, a job set up uh, to work the magic show at Universal Studios, which I worked there for uh, three years. And that's where I did all of my time. That's yeah. how I... It's I mean, thousands I did, of shows. Thousands of I did 15,000 15, shows at, at Universal Studios in Orlando. That's so many. Um, yeah. Uh, so... And th- Oh, and I guess just to finish it off, because yeah. you can ask me whatever, but yeah. like um, how I got to Penguin, one of the magicians that came to work at Theater Magic was Dalton Wayne, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. But if you haven't, Dalton edits a lot of the videos for Penguin. And at the time, he was always submitting tricks to Penguin Magic. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were always like, hey, Dalton, your tricks suck, but your videos are great. <laughs> you should come up here and edit for us. So he left theater and started editing for Penguin. Mm-hmm. I ended up leaving in 2013 to go back home. That's when I was hanging out with Shin and Feldman okay. and um, some of the other guys from Boston for a bit. And then I contacted Dalton like, hey, what's going on with Penguin? How is that? Is that, mm-hmm. is that cool? And he said, hey, they need somebody like you. Come on out here. Maybe, you know, maybe it can work out. So I just said, Screw it. I took, I took a ride out to Ohio yeah. and uh, to kind of scope it out. I was like, it is an actual job that you can have. <laughs> and uh, it was. So I said, screw it. Let's move to uh, Ohio. And I've been here for 10 years. That is that's a wild story. Also, it's it's really fascinating to me how long you spent sort of on your own in the wilderness with magic before you really got into it. And, and now you you know, you've you've got so many friends in magic that you've had for so long, just like, like Jeff Kaler and Shin Lim and Mike Eaton and just all these people who are, I don't know. I mean, like they're, it's, it's an, it's an interesting story. Yeah. I bumped into the right people along the way. Yeah. I bet like my motivation for magic was always, I mean, it's for my own benefit, but, it, yeah. but mainly because it just got me into, into uh, adventure is the right word, but mm-hmm. like just got me into crazy places and, yeah. Where am I? What am I doing right now? How did I, why am I in Philadelphia? I'm doing some close up gig for some <laughs> random band. You know, it's like it's so much fun. I met so many people yeah. and uh, yeah, I had no clue there was a magic community that existed. Zero. And now you're kind of at the center of it, you know, <laughs> yeah, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. I've really enjoyed getting to know you and, uh, and I know some of these stories just because you and I hang out all the time and, uh, and I'm glad that we're able to finally share those with the the penguin people. There's uh, a fun the Shin story. Uh, like, oh yeah, Shin Shin and I uh, both ended up back in Massachusetts around the same time. It was, it was like end of 2012, somewhere in 2013, something like that. And um, he was living in uh, uh, Woburn or something like that. I can't mm-hmm. remember. One of those W towns in Massachusetts. And um, not Worcester, but yeah, I think Wilburn. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we used to hang out like every week. We used to go to um, uh, the British Beer Company in Westford, Massachusetts. <laughs> and I remember was, that was when Shin was putting out like a lot of the controversial products. Like, what was it? Like SSS oh, and yeah. um, um, some other tricks. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing them get so much crap on the internet. And also at the same time, like people saying like, there's no way this would ever work. Yada, yada. And then there I am at like a British beer company, which is like an Applebee's yeah. watching him with a close up pad, like at, <laughs> at this place doing smoke device stuff, like table hopping, right? Yeah. Like these people are crazy on, yeah. uh, online. No, that said the product is whatever, but um, <laughs> shit and I, that winter, it was going into winter and we were both like, Hey, maybe we should. Um, <laughs> it's so funny to think about now, but sh- sh- literally, Shin Lim and I were, were talking about. Um, hey, let's get some money together. Let's run a well, let's rent a kiosk at the mall mm-hmm. at the at the local mall. We're looking at Nashua, New Hampshire, mm-hmm. at the Pheasant Lane Mall, and let's sell magic tricks. Um, 
for the for the Christmas season. Let's demo magic and see how much product we can move. Yeah. We we're going to buy up some of Theater Magic's product and 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 just and and sell it. And I remember we were pricing out we were pricing out kiosks and stuff. And I don't know if it just slipped through the cracks because I can't quite remember at this point. But that's the same point at which I went to the Penguin mm. and Shin went to China to go work at the House of Magic. Yeah, and it's just so funny how like. We were this close to selling magic tricks at the malls. Nothing wrong with that. But it is, it is funny to think about. Like, yeah, I, I mean, Shin, Shin could have been selling magic at the mall together. Oh man, that, that, I I just want that story to be true. I just want it to be true that you and Shin Lim sold magic at a mall. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it almost happened. How do you think that uh, you sort of have turned into like one of the premier? Uh, stand-up performers in the country these days. I don't days. know how that happened. I, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm just kind of wondering too, because I sort of I sort of watched that evolution happen. And I mean, you would, I, I'd almost describe you as a mentalist these days. Yeah, well, yeah. I just, Craig Petty just put out a five by five video on me. Yeah? Like, I don't know if you see, yeah, it's like. I'll have to check that out today. I, yeah, I, I like, just watched your top 10 up. mentalism or mind reading tricks. Oh, sure. I woke up and I'm like, oh, why is why do I have all these Facebook mentions? And, <laughs> and it's because Craig like decided to like just analyze my standup performances. And it's weird that some of the stuff he says, I'm just like, oh my god, like, man, it's uh, it's crazy to think about. Um, yeah, I, I I don't do any like direct mentalism in the sense that I claim power, right? Yeah. I'm not I'm not a mind reader. Yeah. I don't. Um, I, I, I still do a lot of like mental magic and I try to put the credit to other things. Mm -hmm. For example, um, my persona on stage, while it's just very much me, um, it appears that I'm very good at math. Mm -hmm. I'm not, but <laughs> that is a big thing. It also appears that I have a good memory. It's okay. But yeah. I do make a point to like remember everybody's names and things. So like when you start to look at like, man, this guy remembers this guy's name mm -hmm. and wow, how the hell did he add all that stuff up? Like you start to attribute like intelligence and just maybe a little something extra. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm never actually saying that I can do anything, but I'm hoping that the audience like is giving me a little bit more credit than I might deserve. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I mean, the, the, the truth is just some of those Men, me, mentalism tricks are just stronger and it yeah. adds for diversity within your, within your set. Yeah. You know, I, there's only so many card tricks you can do. I still do tons of magic in my set. Um, you know, I do card tricks with sleight of hand and, um, but I, I am, I guess the, the theme of my show at the moment is about predicting the future, mm -hmm. but there's still plenty of magic tricks yeah. along the way. It's uh, it's, I think it's a good mix of magic and uh, mental magic because you know, I think you've opened your show with floating card and now you do Leviosa in it and it, and it just works for you. Like, man, you can, you can float stuff. You want to see Nick float something, but then when you shift over into the more mentalism based stuff, it doesn't feel out of character. It feels, or it doesn't feel like a, like a, like a hard shift that you can't explain. Yeah. I th and I think it's just because I'm, I'm not telling the audience that they're not mm -hmm. like, I'm not trying to tell them that I'm doing something that there's no way that they're going to believe. Yeah. In when you're working for regular people, like you got to meet them somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They ain't going to buy your BS. Right. Well, they're just not. And unless you are, it has so much to do with character and mm -hmm. charisma and how much you're willing to buy into it. And I recognize that, but I'm just not, going to go down that path. And I'm talking about guys like, you know, uh, some of my favorites, like Doc Hilford. Yeah. You know, he can make you believe that he's capable of whatever. Peter Turner. Yeah. You know, like it just oozes out of him. Yeah. He, it would be weird if he told you that he can't do what he <laughs> can do, yeah. you know, because you want to believe people like them. Um, yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not in that. I'd rather let them kind of uh, yeah. figure it out for themselves or let them choose what they want to believe. I think one of my favorite shows you ever did was your very first uh, turn at the magic castle in the parlor. Cause you, you showed me the set and we realized that it was 
basically you were going in there with invisible thread and a Svengali deck to wreck those people <laughs> that you were, you were doing a pitch shop show is what you were doing yeah. at the magic castle. And it yeah. was, and everyone loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, Svengali deck's good. Invisible thread is yeah. good. Um, Craig makes a point too. If you watch that five by five video, mm -hmm. he nails it on the head. Mm -hmm. I don't do the floating card because I think it's like, the uh the best trick in the world i mean it is a great trick it checks other boxes for me mm -hmm. it allows me to open my show without talking mm -hmm. um it, there's loud music i come out and i show them something instantly that grabs their attention mm -hmm. so i don't have to win them with my personality i can let them watch a, a fun trick and then win them over yeah uh with the personality but it's it has nothing to do like any trick that could check those boxes, I would be open to doing. Mm -hmm. Now, I just hope it happened to be very good at the floating card, and nobody else really does it, so it works. It works well for me, and it's co totally unexpected. I mean, yeah. it's like it's what you want to see too. If you're yeah. if you're coming to a, a magic show, I think you want to say you saw something float. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not trying to like convince them. I have the power of levitation. It's very much a show off piece, mm -hmm. right? And if if they think they know how it works, it really doesn't matter. Um, doesn't matter. It's done quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we're on to stuff that is going to fool them. Yeah. You know, so now let's, uh, before we wrap up here and, and uh, turn it over to me and uh, Chris Hanwell talking, uh, let's talk a little bit about your fascination with the Svengali deck, because <laughs> the Svengali deck is one of those things that I think we all get when we first get into magic. I mean, like I, I remember pitching them uh, back at the shops that I worked at when I was, uh, you know, in my early twenties and I have one, but I don't use it, but you mm. carry it around, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, like that's a, that's a go-to thing for you is to use the Svengali deck. What, what is it about the Svengali sure. deck and when are we going to finally get the, the Nicola Capo Svengali book? It's in the pipeline. It's in the pipeline. Uh, it is coming as far as what it is mainly because of the, the pitch shop. Mm -hmm. I had to do it 15,000 times mm -hmm. and there was just so many little secrets and things I discovered with it along the way that, I don't know, just made me, um, why, you know, it's just a fun deck, fun deck to use. Mm -hmm. When I started meeting more magicians, I realized it was even more of a fun thing to carry around with me because it's the last thing people would expect <laughs> me to be carrying. Um, and when you fool a magician with card at number or something like that with a Svengali deck, mm -hmm. Man, it's, uh, it's it's pretty funny. Now at the castle that week, like, yeah, I was like, damn, I'm gonna use this Svengali deck this week. Literally, no one's gonna know that I did. <laughs> um, and like, if you watch that routine, which yeah. is also on that Craig video, yeah, I I don't like if you're paying attention, if you're a card guy and you're watching that that routine, you're probably at some point you got to go hold up because you know it's not yeah. that crazy of a trick like you would if you watched it as a card guy you would just kind of say okay yep uh-huh uh-huh mm -hmm. uh-huh but but no like if you if you thought about it for one mm -hmm. second you'd be like wait a minute how the hell is that possible yeah it's just it's not big enough for you to care mm -hmm. and it's because i'm using a Svengali deck in that performance and uh the, the force is too clean the controls are too clean. Mm -hmm. Everything's too clean about it. Yeah. But at no point is the deck ever displayed all the same. And I also, <laughs> there's a great switch and yeah. the deck gets given out at the end. So, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's, I remember the first time I saw it, I was fooled and I didn't realize how badly I was fooled until you shared the secret with me. And, uh, well, I think, uh, thanks for their talking and letting the, the folk get to know you better. And, uh, mm -hmm. You all know you can reach out to me on Instagram at Eric Tate to have uh, to have suggest some more topics for me and Nick to talk about before. Oh we get yeah, to the main event. we got um maybe uh, maybe we got I have some of Eric Tate. If anybody's interested, I have Eric Tate's original uh, lecture notes from <laughs> two thousand and seven oh, or man. something like that. Those are there is one. What good if there's trick any good there. tricks in there? There's only one good trick in there. Oh. Is it yeah. I can't even remember what's in it. Oh man, I came across those the other day because I'm moving, and I, I found uh, some of the last copies of it. And I was like, I need to get some of these back out and play you need, with them. I think you just need to put them up on eBay for like for like a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> no, I think yeah. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to write a set of, another set of lecture notes. Um, well, and uh, maybe but I mean, how many of those notes exist at this point? Oh, maybe only a hundred. 
Yeah, so figure out what you want. What do you want? Uh, five grand or something? Yeah. So, like, they got to be priced out about four fifty, five hundred bucks, something like that a piece. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then, I think I think I think the listeners will scoop those up. Yeah, we'll get those. And uh, maybe I think I even have some of the special edition version that I did where I I read it. It's it's available as an audio book. And let me tell you, oh my god, that's uh, it's because that was my first lecture, and I had I had nothing to sell, so I thought, well, I'll just I'll make an audio book because I had a CD burner. So, hmm, hmm, yeah. See, the, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the listeners need it. Yeah. Maybe maybe there's a trick in there we can learn. Absolutely. All right. Well, reach out to us again if you want to. If you want to hear uh, some other, if you have some other topics for Nick and I to talk about. Other than that, I'm going to throw it over to myself and Chris Hanawell. See you next week, Nick. Recording stopped. Thanks, as always, to Nick for being on the show. Now, on to the main event. Chris Hanawell is a member of the Penguin Magic team and has been working in the background as a customer service rep getting your accounts taken care of for years. He's also a fabulous performer, putting his skills to use in some of the Marvel films, helming the family shows at the P3 Magic Theater, and so much more. I grabbed some of Chris's time via Zoom, and now you get to join our conversation. Chris Hanawell, thanks for joining me here on the Penguin Magic Podcast. It's amazing that i haven't had you on yet because you know i you're i you're a good friend of mine you yeah, but. work with penguin and uh and we we just we've been too busy to get you on but now you're i here. know i know and we're here i, I love it Woo-hoo. <laughs> so uh, uh, glad to be here there's a lot of things i want to talk to you about um yeah, but. you uh you're known as a, a fairly prolific magic creator and and creator of very strange uh, videos online, uh, but yep. I think the things that people don't know is that you are in the Marvel universe. Yeah, yeah, I actually do have some uh, connections to the Marvel universe, a little bit of Wandavision. Uh, t- uh, tell our audience a little bit about uh, your role in Wandavision. Yeah, so I w- used to work at a magic company called uh, Eddie, Eddie's Trick Shop. Actually, they just showed that shut down; it's now defunct. Um, they called us up and they needed a magician to do some consulting. Uh, for Disney's WandaVision. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing about WandaVision is is it's the first like show they come out came out with. Uh yeah. and it was re- really exciting. It was really fun. Um they took me on set. Uh when I went on set, I didn't even realize that that was the set. I thought it was just like the tents they ate food in, <laughs> but it was the tents from the show. So they th- took me on set. Uh I got a chance to work with Randall Park um who I, th- I believe his name is Inspector Wu in the show. Yeah. Or Agent Wu. Yeah. And I worked with him for two weeks and we went through so much magic and he was such a delight. And uh, and what it ma- ended up making it into the show is, uh, if you guys remember, in the first episode, Agent Wu uh, makes a card appear mm-hmm. uh, with a back palm. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I was able to teach him that. And we spent a lot of time together just hanging out with the crew and it's honestly a huge blessing to be able to uh, be a part of Marvel, man. Like that's the biggest thing ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like I've, I've, it's funny how like I, I keep gathering friends who are sort of like canon in the Marvel universe now, which is really fun. Uh, mm-hmm. but the, uh, the, it's interesting because that, that character was originally an Ant-Man and in the second mm-hmm. Ant-Man film, they had Blake vote on to, uh, to, to sort of, you know, as a, as an excuse for teaching magic. And I love that, that, through line made it over into WandaVision. What other magic did you work on him with? Because I don't remember a lot of his magic making it into the show. You know, uh, not a lot of it made it in. We had a lot of uh, ideas with flap cards and we had some matchbook tricks. Um, There were a few things that were going to get in the show. It was going to be a bigger part, but I think they just cut it for story reasons or whatever. And But I do like that they kept that through, through line because I was familiar with Blake Voigt's um, involve, involvement with it but maybe he couldn't make it out to Atlanta or something. So they wanted to use a local uh, from Atlanta and it worked out. But man, it just was a really fun experience. And uh, he was pretty familiar with magic as well, man. Randall Park was such a cool guy. We, we stayed in contact that for a little bit afterwards. And uh, yeah, very, very humble, very cool guy. Uh, uh, just, we, had, we had a great time. And it was weird because it was at the very start of Corona. Like yeah. the, I, I got the call for that and then Corona was announced. Oh, and uh yeah. Yeah. It was it was crazy, man. The, the coronavirus, not corona, the adult beverage. Just just Yeah, for- yeah. Both, both of them actually. <laughs> <laughs> At the exact same time Corona the Beverage came out, Corona the Virus came out. So you you moved to Columbus uh 
yes. to be here in the like in our production studios and be sort of closer to the team uh, about a year and a half ago. Can you describe uh, for the listeners like what it is you do for Penguin? Because it's yeah, yeah. two things that are pretty interesting, and uh, and I and I'll I'll steer you to where, where I really want to hear uh, some of your stuff in a little bit. But go for it. All right, let's get it. So I've been with Penguin for about. I would say five and a half years now, um, maybe more or less. Uh, but I moved out here to Columbus about a year and a half ago, as you said, and um, I do mostly customer service. So if you've been on the Penguin chat line, that's me. You're talking to me, me or Eric Ostrich, which is funny because he's also an Eric with a K, which is the best kind of Eric uh, from what I can understand. <laughs> a lot of people, um, they're talking to Eric in the chat, think they're talking to me. And I they come up to me all the time at conventions and say, Eric, you helped me out with this customer service thing. And I'm like, different Eric, but I'll let him know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, no, you should just pretend it's you. <laughs> it's like, dude, I do like 12 different things here. And I'm also in the chat line, dude. Um, but yeah, dude, no, Eric Ostrich is awesome. And uh, he's he's an amazing resource for magic. If you ever want to hop on the chat, ask some questions, say hi, say hello, whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, man, uh, I, so I do chat and I also uh, review all of our tricks that come through our partner program. That's what and I would, wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's 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 really interesting. You see probably more magic than I do because mm -hmm. of reviewing all of those videos. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh it's really an interesting feeling being like a Simon Cowell of magic. Like I kind of have to be <laughs> absurdly honest with these people. Um, because you know, you see some amazing, amazing works, mm -hmm. and then you know, you see some stuff that oh, maybe it's not as original, maybe it's not as um, you know, it wouldn't really necessarily be markable in, in a current magic world. Mm -hmm. And it puts me in a position of like, you know, I'm always seeing magic as it's coming out. So it's able to help me be creative and be current and uh, be where magic stands today. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's a very interesting uh, position to be in. What do you think makes a good partner trick with Penguin? Uh, and, and I know that's it, a really broad question. Yeah, it's um so many variables. I would say mostly what I like to see is something that um, can be done. <laughs> something that can be done. Um, I'm not going to say any names, but I have a funny a funny story about a funny submission. Mm -hmm. um, and this was some, something that rings in my, my head as something that is not good for partner. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the person, but it was a trick. Um, it looked incredible. Mm -hmm. It was a matchstick. They hold the matchstick, right? Mm -hmm. And then light, lights and flames. And then I was like, man, this is killer, yeah. killer, killer trick. All right. Um, let, let me see how this is done. So I look at the tutorial. And the method is a guy off to the side of the screen with a blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you telling me about this. It's a, The method is a man with a blowtorch. And... Um, I'd like to think if it was a physical product, like it comes with the guy like in the mail. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but basically just not that. I, I want to see something that can be done. I want to see something that has some creative merits. Um, of course, you know, everything that's been made is under the sun. So it's like easy to have people to come in and, you know, just reinvent the wheel. And um, that's something that I, I typically want to stay away from as far as putting things in partner Which also um, isn't a bad thing because i think very often when mm -hmm. you see submissions like that it's it's from people who just aren't aware that the thing that they have independently come to is already exists so they're it's not like they're stealing or anything it's just that like they it's actually almost a compliment to them because they're thinking along the same lines as other people that are are really good. So if you if someone else has the same idea as you, it's it's not something to be frustrated. It's actually something to be proud of because you you're thinking well. You're spitting game, my brother. That's exactly what I think as well. And I think whenever I come up with something that's like, oh, this is actually really interesting, mm -hmm. and I see that it's been made before, it's like you know what? At least I'm in that headspace. At least I have the capability to come up with something that I thought was new, but still has been proven to be good. Mm -hmm. you know, and which should inspire you more than anything, you know? Um, but there, but there are so many great things that come to the partner program, man. If you were to spend an afternoon just scrolling 
just mm-hmm. scrolling through those downloads, you'd find some things that are just like, wow, I couldn't even, wouldn't even imagine that uh, these gems would be hidden here, you know? There, Yeah, there is some like amazing stuff that's like, that's only available on Penguin because it's through the partner program that people just mm-hmm. don't know about because there's just so many things on the site and so many creative people submitting stuff. So many. And like it, it one that sticks out to me, and I, I I don't know why exactly in the moment, but uh uh Roof Randolph, no Rudolph, Ralph Rudolph, Ralph Rudolph mm-hmm. sleeping, no, not sleeping queen. Uh, it's Queen something. Uh Sleeping Queen. Ralph is- Rudolph. Yeah, Sleeping Queen's a Dan Haas effect. Um something the Queen. Uh look up Ralph Rudolph Queen. And it's a linking card effect that's probably the best one in the game. Uh, and it's one of those things that just came out on partner. And linked forever or framing watch? It's linked forever. Yeah. Say it again. Linked forever is, uh, looks like it's the one where the, the queen is linked onto a wine glass. Not that one. Not uh, that one. Are you thinking of? Um, framing the queen. Framing Washington is the, the banknote one. Oh, okay. Okay. He has a banknote one as well. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I, I wonder I've if it's the same one. I've but you've seen this guy. Yeah, he's really good. He's really, really good and, and makes a lot of great, um, you know, linking and impossible object kind of puzzle kind of things. And those things just get lost sometimes, man, because we we get floods and floods of magic and great magic on Penguin. And it's, uh, it, you know, uh, I, I would love to highlight these folks that have these amazing little uh, downloads that, you know, to get washed out. But I, I framing the queen is one that I do all the time. And uh, you know, I just know it here. It's framing the queen by fair magic. It looks like fair he, magic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll I'll include a link to it in the uh, show description for anyone who wants to check it out. But yeah, there's a ton of stuff like this where it's just like shot on somebody's cell phone. Um, mm-hmm. It's not like the crazy high production value stuff that that we do here because we have access to the best toys. Uh, right. But it's it's still great magic. Right, right. And we've been playing with those toys, man. Those those toys we got have been very fun. I've been Q labbing it up, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, you've started doing uh your show at the uh P3 Magic Theater, which is interesting because yeah. you're you're starting to add a lot more production value because you were more of a busker street guy, uh an occasional comedy club guy, and now you're like putting together a full thing. What's that been like? Yeah, man, it's a journey. Uh it is definitely something that uh I am trying to gain a muscle for, you know, uh, I'm definitely a student in live sh- show production. Um, definitely the mixed media aspect of it is the most difficult point in the creation process. Um, and I, I want to keep the show fresh and wild and reverent mm-hmm. and something that like people can really see that like, Oh, he's adding video to this. Oh, there's like weird flashing lights. Oh, there's a, there's a lot of music added to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's been great. And and a part of that process is also also been doing these monthly family sh- excuse me doing these monthly family shows mm-hmm. that like really really allow me to sharpen my knife and understand how to engage uh, anybody of any age because. In those situations, you have to figure out how to entertain the youngest of the young kids Mm -hmm. and the oldest of the old folks, you know? So it's like, it's a, it's a balance of the two. What are you, what are you doing to thread that needle? Um, being goofy, being a little silly, (laughs) being a little goofy, being a little silly, uh, and, and doing the basically magic that I find, um, people would relate to in a, in a current sense. Like for example, one thing I've been doing recently is I made a giant captcha, right? So I'll say, you know what? You never be safe these days. So I got to make sure you guys aren't robots. So you, I need you to complete this captcha. And then somebody says, I'm not a robot. And then the check mark appears yeah. in the captcha. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I, I think this, this is a situation where everybody can relate to. They've probably related to it in that day, you know? The yeah. I think the the gimmicks that you make 
are really because like you're you're describing this idea of something that where this big green check mark appears. Uh, I think one of my one of my favorite memories of you is at Magi Fest at two in the morning and you just machine gunning insane card gimmicks at Eric Jones. Yeah. He was just like, show me the next one, show me the next one, show me the next one. <laughs> How did you get started in building some of those flaps? Because some of the stuff you make is incredibly sophisticated. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Um, so I would say, honestly, the pandemic was a, a point where I found myself falling in love with the process of creating things. Mm -hmm. um otherwise like before that i was creating but in a different sense um i found really myself like bentley of course i made when i was you know a young kid right like i was like 16 17 um but it was one of those one-off discovery kind of thing mm -hmm. um when corona hit i was like okay i just started making flaps let's see how far we can take this and then mm -hmm you start to find pockets and you start to find animations and then you get inspired from and Instagram is also a big, big point of that. Like just seeing the community there and seeing the um, wild magic from people like Elliot Gerard and Alan Simonov uh, and Kayla Morelli. Um, all those folks just make me kind of like, Oh man, I, I think there's something to, uh, you know, just construction in card magic and in magic in general and uh it's all about falling in love with the process and being in that flow state and being open to concepts that um you know aren't necessarily magic in the moment it's more so like art concepts but then can be twisted into uh an effect um yeah like like for for example uh i have a card change where you see a loading wheel appear on the front of the card i was just and you shake it that. yeah yeah and that came from literally watching just watching youtube yeah you know pulling up some asmr for for the, <laughs> for those of you who are listening at home the chris shows a card and then suddenly the loading symbol like the youtube buffering symbol uh or animation appears and spins on the card and then it changes into a different card and uh I was actually, I wasn't necessarily thinking of it because of the animation. I was thinking of it because of what you said about being open, uh, mm -hmm. because that strikes me as an interesting trick where, okay, the, the inspiration from trying to watch a YouTube video and it buffering and then translating that into like a real thing is interesting, but where do you find yourself performing that or coming up with a routine for it? Uh, because, and just because in my world, I'm very focused on you know, commercial routines that I can do at my restaurant gig or in my live show. But so many times I see you creating these really out there ideas and it doesn't seem like you limit yourself to, Hey, this needs to be in a show or something like that. You just have an idea of some wild visual or some silly sight gag and you just make it without any thought of the venue or, or where it needs to be. And for, for my thought process, I mm -hmm. I'll, I need to have that because mm -hmm. where I find my magic and where I where I find the things that I do for real folks and the things I do for Instagram, mm -hmm. it's all about like having a pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. And the, at the bottom of the pyramid, everything is thrown at the wall. Yeah. Everything is thrown at the wall, right? Anything goes, all right? So you have all this huge space of like, okay, here's the idea. Then you refine it and you cut some stuff and you refine it. And then, okay, now I'm a little bit better. Okay. Ah, I've gotten to this point this, where this actually does work, <laughs> you know? So it's these things and it's these ideas that you may need to let go, you know, because you can't do it in every environment, like flap work. People are going to hear that flap sometimes, you know, you're going to hear that little, little click, but in the right situation, that's a miracle. That's yeah. You just got to find your situations, you know, situational magic is where, I think where it's at um, mm -hmm. because without it, we're not on our toes, you know, um, for example, for example, the loading card, mm -hmm. it could be do done in real life, but there are things that you need to be, you know, cautious of mm -hmm. in order to be able to do it because, you know, it's a flap. It, it, it has, you know, it has its downsides, but again, maybe in, 
three years, I think, oh, dude, I can get rid of that and I can make it. So it's just this. And, yeah. you, you know, it, again, it's just that that letting letting the, letting yourself take these moments to come to an ultimate um, yeah. ending point. And we're all students, so we don't necessarily have an ending point, but getting comfortable enough to get close to that. I think that that's a really interesting sentiment, because when you look at the loading card right now, like you know, it's kind of thick. It's got lots of layers because there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. And so you sort of right. look at it as like this beautiful, this beautifully constructed thing that is like a Rube Goldberg machine, like <laughs> built into a yeah. playing card. Right. But you, you still yeah. sort of instinctively know it's like more like a toy than like a miracle. Right. Absolutely. Uh, but Absolutely. You're, you're not closing yourself. You're not just putting it away because it has this toy like quality. You're, yeah you're letting your skills grow and then maybe you'll find something new and then you go, Oh, we actually could get to the point where this is not a silly sight gag. It's actually a miracle. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it's just taking that time, let it, letting everything influence you. And, um, you know, cause at, at, at first the way it looked was just not able to be done really. And then it did get to that point. It got to that point where I figured out that, you know, I, I just, cut a lot of stuff about it um mm -hmm. figure out another another system in order to make it a little more fair um mm -hmm. and again it, it's still not a finished project and once it is man i i think if you could genuinely have a loading card from somebody and then it changes uh, that's something that does no words are needed because yeah people have always waited first things to load <laughs> yeah. um and and again I'm, I'm comfortable with uh you know things being thick or things being mm -hmm difficult to perform in real life because a lot of the times it's not what i'm creating for a lot of the times i'm just creating because i love it or be creating yeah. for instagram or creating just because i think something's interesting and mm -hmm. um i i want to you know uh dive into that and then you create for other reasons you create for real life and you and you know it's all about that headspace and flow space and you know the, i think the thing that's like really advantageous is to not let that flow state be disrupted by oh this needs to be something that's uh this needs to be something that i have to perform in front of a person one foot away like uh if you can take a step back and be like all right where does this belong then uh it makes it makes it the creation process that much more freeing and fun and, and open can you talk a little bit more about flow state because that's always something I've more associated with jugglers and you know like mm -hmm. movement activities style people but it sounds really? like using flow state in like a different uh creative mm -hmm. term mm -hmm. so like, how do jugglers see flow state actually I, you know, I, I need I'm from my time as a juggler it was the idea of like it's sort of getting to a place where your body was just moving and you you were reacting to the objects moving and you weren't having to actively think or focus yeah on what it was right? yep it's it's the exact same thing um if i am overthinking something mm -hmm. then i think it's gonna ruin the entire process of creation mm -hmm. uh if i'm in my flow state then i could get idea after idea after idea Mm -hmm. a marathon of ideas because i'm not actively trying to create i'm just open to the world around me or i'm open to concepts around me um, i'm just seeing the veil of reality and the natural order of it and trying to distort it in my own vision of things right so the, the time to be critical is not during that creative process the time is, is if you once you've achieved this this flow state and you're in your creative and ideas are coming out and you're manifesting them when when that ends when that tapers off that's when you come back and your your critical mind steps back in and goes okay well this is i mean this is a cool visual but like practically it requires three magnets a flamethrower and a guy off stage with a blowtorch um <laughs> and the blowtorch is very important <laughs> imagine the dude's yeah. off the outside the curtain dude yeah but that i like i think that that's Seems like a liability actually <laughs> <laughs> but that's it seems like something where you're you're doing your best to keep your critical mind at bay until much later and that must be difficult on some level so 
it, it is difficult because you know it's in building something that's when you're like okay so this is the, it's a trial and error it's like this is annoying this is frustrating let me try to figure out why this is not working oh that that, that does work da, 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 da. the flow state is all about desire if i have the desire to create something new it will happen and this is not just me this is everybody a- anybody can get into this flow state yeah um and david lynch i, I don't know if you're if you from over David yeah. Lynch's work. Um, I don't really know his movies that well, but I love hearing him speak about creativity and about being open. Mm-hmm. And the way he describes it is creativity. It's like a big lake and you're fishing, right? Sometimes when you're fishing, you catch a small fish. When times, sometimes when you're catching, you catch a huge fish. You're like, whoa, this is, how did I get this fish? You know. But as long as you're fishing, you can be able to um, just pull something out. And it's that desire that causes um, these you know, new concepts. Um, yeah. And sometimes these new concepts go nowhere because where would you know them? Right. And since sometimes these new content, these new concepts are incredible because it's something that I, that, that, that I would do for years. Right. Like for example, um, I play the rubber chickens. The, the, <laughs> and, playing the rubber chickens is arguably one of my favorite parts of your show. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank tell, you. tell our listeners about playing the rubber chickens. <laughs> oh, I, so i got them chickens on me right um yeah uh am i able to describe the joke in this yeah, i uh i think so <laughs> you think so you think so okay well, tell you so what I, start describing the joke and if i if i have to immediately stop you to keep this family friendly i will <laughs> okay cool, cool cool so yeah dude stop me stop me you know the point what you're gonna stop yeah. so i i i do some pre-show i, I get someone to uh force smoke in the water right Mm-hmm. And I said, guys, what if inside of this box is pure smoke and pure water? Turn the box upside down. Chickens fall out. I say, this is not smoke or water. This is chickens. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, this one's my favorite chicken. This is a tail of the hen. Mm-hmm. Oh, this this one is great. Um, he has a beautiful hen waddle, uh, beautiful hen talons, amazing hen beak, and yep. a wonderful. Yeah. We're going to skip that joke. but uh... We're going to skip the joke. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of wordplay that is uh, not not for public broadcast. But yeah. That's when you notice that the chicken make noises, right? Yes. So I'm like, oh, wait, well, and then I, I squeeze the chicken and then I'm like, oh, okay. And then I put one chicken under my arm, another chicken under my arm, put here, here. Yeah. And I play with the chickens, you know, uh, smoke in the water. And that came from just me being at Eddie's trick shop in which RIP Eddie's, if you guys have ever been Marietta, Georgia, yeah. and you've seen Eddie's trick shop since the seventies, mm-hmm. it was my home. It was, it was wonderful. Now it just, just yeah. close so it's we're, we're seeing brick and mortar go down but i got i digress yeah um uh i was we had a bunch of rubber rubber chickens and there was this annoying kid one day just squeezing chickens incessantly and then i kind of noticed that they're different tones and i was like well so me and my homies were just like okay we're gonna squeeze chickens hmm. and we noticed that you can play smoke in the water with these chickens i spent like 40 dollars on rubber chickens that day <laughs> <laughs> Which are like, like arguably like they're, they're one of like the, uh, the, your most prized possessions. Like you never, you never go anywhere unless you know where your four rubber chickens are, because I imagine finding new chickens to play smoke on the water with would be impossible. It's impossible. So these chickens are literally my like gold, like pure gold. Cause otherwise I'm not gonna be able to find it. I would have to go on a chicken run <laughs> in order to find chickens. I would love to see your renter's insurance and like, was your stuff as itemized down? And then like on there is smoke on the water chickens that like, that's like, that's the first thing that your renter's insurance has. Is. Cause otherwise I lose, I, I lose one of those dang chickens, man. Yeah. I am, I am out on a routine. So, <laughs> um, I have been, uh, talking with a friend of mine, Mike Gazy from, um, Columbus. And he also, he, he, orig- he actually also had the idea to play chickens. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because he was never able to do it because he couldn't tune chickens, right? Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Dude, you actually did this! Like, this is like..." And he, uh, he, he was just floored because I've been doing it for years, right? Yeah. Um. So uh, we're we're in the process of trying to figure out how to tune chickens to play any song. Um. And also, one thing I've been doing recently in my family shows, um. Uh, I've been instead kind of performing it as uh, what's the trick by. I want to say Mike Cavney is, is does the human xylophone. 
Um, uh, Mike Haveney does do the human xylophone, but I believe yeah. it was uh, Keith Fields uh, who originated the human xylophone. Yes, yes. So I've been doing it as the human xylophone mm -hmm. uh, with four kids on stage. Uh, and it's been really, really interesting to play with because I because I had not done it like that before um, before mm -hmm. doing these family shows. And I think doing it with four kids on stage that like immediately want to start honking these chickens annoyingly and be, and be and me getting like, you know, annoyed at the <laughs> at the chickens and then kind of using that to my benefit in the routine uh, is really fun. There's so there's a lot to be done there, and it's just so so dumb. It's just chickens, dude. It's like playing chickens, but people gravitate toward it towards it because there's something there, you know. Oh, there's 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 definitely something there. Well, Chris, this has been a very enjoyable conversation about creativity, uh, Marvel, and chicken. Yeah, bud. We'll have to have you back on again sometime. Thanks so much for joining us on the Penguin Magic. Yeah, dude. Hey, thank you for having me, man. It's been a blast. That's going to do it for this week, kids. Thanks so much to Chris for being on the show, and thanks to you for listening. I had a blast in Nashville last week and loved saying hello to all of the Penguin fans that came out. I think we had at least three Penguin fans in every show, and it was so cool to see all of you in person. Also, big shout out to the Penguin Magic shipping and warehouse team. My life has been in a little bit of chaos, and I didn't count correctly and didn't bring enough props to Nashville. And let me tell you, the Penguin Magic shipping and warehouse team were Johnny on the spot, getting me the stuff I needed to do a great show overnight. Even if I didn't work for Penguin, I would always count on that team. We have the best damn shipping team in the industry. My next trip out will be at the IBM convention in Tacoma this summer. I hope to see all of you there. As always, we're a weekly podcast, so be sure to like and subscribe as well as share your favorite episodes on the social media platform that you've been shopping for home furnishings on. If you wanted to reach out to me about anything on this week's show, put it on my Amazon wish list. I am so close to closing on a new house. I actually close on Monday, and I'm going to furnish the entire thing in one go on Amazon Prime. It's a personal challenge to myself. I want to go down in history a lot like Shaquille O'Neal. But if mail order home decor or isn't your vibe, you can always hit me up on Instagram at Eric Tate. That's at E-R-I-K-T-A-I-T. -I -I From me and everyone else here at the P3 Magic Studios, practice, practice, perform.